apologies again to start with. Um, <clears throat> we apologize for the good food and wine, <clears throat> which makes evening sessions particularly challenging. <laughs> um, and secondly, um, I do apologize if sometimes I get carried away and start speaking too fast. If I do that again, feel free to wave anything. Sheet of paper, a pen, a chair, uh, and I will try to slow down. Um, it, it's a constant effort in con conferences like this where for many of you, English is not your first language. Uh, it, it is a challenge and those of us who do have the English as our first language really applaud you for the extra effort you put in. I, I tried to imagine if I were in a conference in French the effort I would be making to, to follow along and, and, and to engage. So uh, if I do go too fast, it's probably because I'm excited about something and I need perhaps to be reminded to be slowed down. Okay, so uh, this evening, uh, in a sense, uh, before supper, uh, we were on, uh, in a musical scale sort of um, mode, we were on a major note. It was a note of enthusiasm, it was a note of a crescendo of this wonderful tradition in character education that is coming to us from the classical world, coming to us from a robust theological tradition uh, of which many of us are, are heirs. Uh, tonight, after supper, imagine that we're going into a minor key. Um, the mood becomes a little, a little more, a little more sad, uh, a little more somber as we actually consider the, the passion, the depth of character education in higher education and in particular in theological education. So this session uh, will try to do three things. Um, <clears throat> first of all, simply define what we actually mean by the death of character education. What are we actually talking about? What does it look like? So a diagnostic tool to assess what is death of character education. Um, the second will be, and this will be sort of the, the longer part uh, of what I have to say, will be some to explore some reasons for the decline and death of character education in theological education. I have 10 reasons that I would like to put on the table to discuss with you and to stimulate your thinking. The third part of the evening, I will be turning it over to you, so we'll be working again in groups around the tables, um, <clears throat> to explore what is it that we lose in theological education with if character education dies. So if there is a passion of character education in what we actually do, what do we stand to lose? So these are the three topics for tonight. Now, the, the first thing, I'd like to get you talking again, just at the start. Um, and I'd like to have you work on this particular thesis. Now, many of you work with doctoral students or master level students um, and they come to you and you're their supervisor and they often come to you with a thesis. And your job, my job with these students is to help them develop their thesis. And we all know how to do this. This is part of our professional job. Um, we do a number of things with students. So what I'd like you to do, I'll give you about five minutes again at the start, and I'd like you to go in twos again, and I would like you to uh, perform a little role play. Choose which one of you is the student and which one of you is the supervisor. So one of you is the student, doesn't necessarily have to be the younger one in the group, uh, the other is the supervisor. The student is coming to you and this is their thesis. Uh, or their hypothesis, depending on how you'd like to define it, that in losing character education, theological education has lost its soul. Strong thesis, which makes it a good thesis. Um, and so what I'd like you to do um, is um, help your students, or just go in the second bit here, help your imaginary student shape the thesis. So what sort of advice would you offer in clarifying the thesis, 
What kind of methodology would you suggest? What might be the outline of this sort of thesis? Um, any ideas of a literature review? Um, is it original? What bits would be original? Are there weaknesses? Is the thesis falsifiable? Because any good thesis can also be demonstrated as false. And if so, how might that be? Uh, the scope and, and so forth. Okay, so uh, if you're the student, try to be really interested, really engaging, ask all the hard questions, put your supervisor in a difficult position. If you're the supervisor, try to do your job. Okay, is the mandate clear? Okay, about five minutes, couples of two. One is the supervisor, one is the doctoral or the master level student. Okay, can we? Can we come together? By the way, if, if, you, if you do have real students who would be interested in investigating this thesis, I'd be happy to consider supervising them at LST. So um, this could become reality. All right, good. So um, let's, having focused a little bit on this daring thesis that the death of character education is, is important, it's significant. Uh, at least as a thesis to consider in theological education. Um, let's move in to actually investigate the first, first of all, the question to define what do we actually mean by the death or the passion of character education. So here, here's my proposal to you, um, is that when we speak of the death or passion of character education in theological education, we mean that it is three things. Unclear, marginal, and unintentional. So three key words, and I'll now unpack each one of those to help us uh, understand what I'm trying to say. So unclear, marginal, and unintentional. Um, first of all, that character education is unclear. What I mean here is that in a context of theological education, um, definitions of character education are vague. Um, we're not quite or to key terms in the New Testament like righteousness, piety, um, and key theological terms that the connection is vague. Um, even its place in theological education is is vague, it's unclear. There, there's a sense that it's important, but it is not as clear and sharp as it might be. Um, I also mean by unclear that our aspirations in terms of character education do not always translate into educational clarity. So there's a, there's a sort of a nostalgic aspirational value in character, but it's not translated into what we actually do and how we strategize. If asked, most of the leaders, staff, or faculty in a school where there is, in fact, a passion of character education will falter, will, will hesitate in, um, in explaining a clear action plan. Ah, this is what we understand and what we do in character education. Um, I also mean by unclear that there is no explicit conce conceptual framework for character education. So whereas we've worked out conceptual frameworks for other parts of what we do in education, we've not done the same for character education. So for example, uh, tomorrow in the seminar on online character education, I'll be uh, talking about a neo-Aristotelian framework for character education, which is a, a theoretical framework to undergird what is actually done in practice. Um, uh, that's one example of many possibilities. But if character education is dead, I'm saying there's an unclear, no explicit conceptual framework. Um, so we're not scholarly about it, to be uh, blunt. Um, there's also in a, in a school where character education is unclear, there is a not an explicit and prevalent language of virtue and character education in the learning community. <clears throat> so whereas we may 
uh, so I was speaking during the break to, uh, to, to someone about you know, the importance, for example, of students in a residential context who do not make their beds. Obviously, the bed making example had <laughs> worked from before. In, in how many of our schools, if we walk through the dormitories and we open the doors, what do the rooms look like? Um, now, a, a very messy room um, in a character education sort of thinking mode means that that person has uh, an issue with the virtue of orderliness. Um, now, it's one thing to simply say, oh, well, students need to keep their beds, <coughs> their rooms tidier, because it's important and it just kind of goes there. Much different to have an explicit language where we address our community saying, we are working on the virtues intentionally. Orderliness is one of the virtues that we aspire to as Christian disciples and future leaders. An instance of this is what the way we keep our rooms, the way we keep our desktops, our punctuality in attending lectures and handing in things, the way we manage our time. This all has to do with the virtue of orderliness. And so, in a sense, you're maybe saying and doing the same things, but in an explicit language of virtue and character. Therefore, what you're doing is not clear. That's my point. And finally, there's an absence in the mission statements and learning outcomes. <clears throat> that if you actually look at the mission statement of a college, you don't find an explicit reference to, a clear reference to character education as part of what you're really about. And if you look at the learning outcomes of the programs and of the modules that you teach um, or the curriculum map, there is not an explicit mention of character. You can't find it clearly. Okay. So that's my first point, um, unclarity. And <clears throat> hopefully as I go through this, um, it, it's a bit like Jesus writing in the sand. Uh, hopefully we will look at these words and reflect back on our practice and go, ah, yes, we do these things well in our school, or maybe we do some of them well, or maybe we don't do many of these well. And in a sense, tonight is a doctor's visit. You're going to measure your pressure to see the state of character education in your particular context. So the first point, character education, I'm suggesting is dead or dying if it is unclear. Second point is, and it's similar, but distinct enough to be a separate point, is that character education is marginal. What I mean is that it, at best, it operates at the periphery of what we do. It is in what we have now called the extra curricular. It is not part of the core curriculum. It is extra curricular. And we all know that in the minds of students, in the minds of faculty, in the minds of accreditors, the extra curricular really is marginal. It's nice. It's not the main thing. Um, I also mean by marginal that it is a not, not a core feature of our certification. So by certification, I mean what you certify as a student having achieved something, so typically a degree. So we all have our graduation ceremonies. Uh, we issue diploma supplements. Uh, we issue transfer statements. Uh, we certify that a certain kind of learning has happened. And I'm arguing that if character education has no form of certification from our schools, and I'm not saying it's easy, um, but if it has no form of certification, then it is marginal. So it can happen or not happen. Thirdly, <coughs> it is marginal if it is not compulsory in accreditation. <clears throat> so if you can get accredited as a school <clears throat> and do nothing in terms of character education and actually produce uh, graduates that are not virtuous at all, uh, I would again argue it is marginal. And, th and fourthly, if it is not assessed or given credit. <clears throat> and as someone rightly uh, reminded, um, what doesn't give credit tends to not have value. So marginal. Um, now, I'm not saying there's not challenges with all of these, and that's part of what we're saying. Why is this now going to be so challenging? Why has it actually died? <clears throat> My third <coughs> descriptor for death is that character education, if it does happen, is, it's unintentional. 
Um, so there, there is a, a low level of planning in the school around character education. There's not, it, it, it doesn't appear often on the agendas of your board meetings or of your academic faculty meetings um, or of your program board meetings. Um, there, there isn't a high level of, of planning. There, there's not an intentional focus. There's not an implementational strategy for character education. If it happens, it's nice. We all applaud it. We think this is really great. But we're not quite sure how it happened or how to replicate it. Um, I also mean that by unintentional is that it, it might just happen, but it is mostly caught. Um, and I think a lot of good is happening in our colleges, and it is caught because there are men and women of God who are working in these colleges. They do create a culture of virtue and of character, and so there's a lot of character that gets caught by the students. But it might be unintentional, um, or at least not as focused as it, as it might be. Not a well-articulated and monitored educational plan behind it. So it might happen, it might not. So it receives little focused attention. Um, uh, there's no, uh, the focus we give in designing, monitoring, and assessing cognitive learning, academic, or the practical skills, that same level of attention is not given to character education. Um, it is not integrated into the curriculum map, and in a sense we delegate character education to other domains. We, we say, or maybe we don't say, but we think, well, the student will sort it out with the Lord. Yeah. The Lord will have to deal with you. Or it may be a church issue, that the student, when they're in church, it, it will be the pastor. This is a, a church discipleship issue. We, we as theological educators are, are doing other things, and so there's an unintentional delegation to other domains. Um, Clearly, we're not dealing with an all or nothing scenario. It's not, oh, character education is dead or it's flourishing. Um, all of us probably can look at this list and say, okay, yes, here is where we are as a particular school. So hopefully this, uh, this helps you understand what I'm thinking about when I think about the passion and the death of character. It's this sort of a descriptive situation that I have in mind. So, um, having made that definition, the question, the main question I would like to tackle tonight is the question, what killed character education? So if it was alive and flourishing, as we saw in the first uh, uh, session, what then happened? So what killed character education? This sort of reminds me of the movie Who Killed Roger Rabbit? I don't know why, but <laughs> um, and, and actually the, the, the figure in, you can't see it very well, but that's actually the, the figure of the man who killed Roger Rabbit. Um, okay, so, so the question is, character education was alive, then died, what happened? I have 10 reasons. Um, the first, set, and, they're, and they're divided into three groups. The first group of reasons are cultural, are broadly cultural reasons. The second group of reasons are educational, specific, specific educational. educational reasons. The third set of reasons are contextual reasons for evangelical theological education. So more about our distinctives, and there's reasons there as well. So here is the list, and then we'll go down and I will mercifully break it into bullet points. Uh, with a few images to lighten it up, uh, to not keep you on this list. But here's, I'll just read them so you know where we're going. So the following cultural, historical, educational factors have contributed to the death of character education. One, a culture of rationalism and research. Two, the ethics of authenticity. Three, the theoreputicalization of society. I'm only going to say that once. Um, four, managerialism and measurability. Five, the Babylonian captivity of accreditation. Six, the loss of the university. Seven, the Roman domination of standard curricula. Eight, the replacement of character by discipline. Nine, the safety of academics. And ten, the professional professor. 
So let's start with the cultural reasons. First reason is a culture, character education is my thesis has been killed by a culture of rationalism and research. I won't bore you with a lesson on the history of European thought, because probably of you, many of you actually teach that. <laughs> but just to say that emerging from the Enlightenment, rationality and the cognitive area of a human being were seen as the way to human flourishing. If you were to flourish as a human being, it was through the use of reason. And if society was to improve, it was because key human beings were using their reasoning powers to improve society. So the Enlightenment narrative, um, Lyotard, the postmodern writer, actually critiques it. He says, the hero of knowledge works toward the good social political end. So that is the enlightenment narrative. There is a hero of knowledge. You know, you have used it, and you are the hero who is going to improve society. Now, this clearly had very deep impacts on education and on higher education. And I'm speaking to many of you who come from Germany, and clearly this was seen in the University of Berlin. Um, University of Berlin, which is probably rightly considered the alpha model of all modern universities in the world. What von Humboldt did in Berlin, um, the, his educational concept, <coughs> um, grounded in the philosophy of Leibniz, in which striving for the truth was the real meaning of life, and inner perfection was through reason and Kant as well. He considered the university the home of reason, where all of the faculties work together for the benefit of the state. That was the project of the University of Berlin that then spread throughout the world. So reason, again, is in the cockpit. That is the important thing of higher education. Um, now, this, of course, led to see research as the key to human progress. So in the university, reasoning human beings perform research activities to improve human life across the discipline. The basic enlightenment narrative behind educational projects was that we all become free and prosper as we learn information. If you wish to learn to read more about this, uh, again, Kelsey between Athens and Berlin is a good starting place. He actually compares the Athens model with the Berlin model, which is exactly what I've been outlining. Now, his historians, and there may be historians in the room, so I'm happy to be uh, corrected, uh, have um, suggested that evangelicalism uh, actually is deeply influenced by rationalism and often has privileged truth over other values such as beauty and goodness. If I were to ask any of you rank truth, beauty, and goodness, we would probably all put truth in the top. Now, and again, it, it's, it is the truth that we receive through reason, and in our case, through engaging with reason, with scripture, and the revelation. Um, it is not surprising, therefore, that theological education in the evangelical tradition has become a place to know and to research truth by reason. That is the bread and butter of what most of us do and have received in our theological education. Um, in this overwhelming scenario of, don't get me wrong, very good rational engagement with our cognitive, with our rational, with our God-given ability to reason, think, and discover, a good thing, but what has happened? As we've engaged with propositional truth, character education has been squeezed out to the margins. 
So what I'm saying here, and forgive me, this is probably my longest, most complex point, but it is important, is that it's a long story of the culture that we live in, and our theological education has been a reflection of that. And that, I am arguing, has contributed to the death of character education. A good thing has squeezed out another good thing. Second point, and um, we will, if you're happy with this, at the end of the 10 points, if you're not completely exhausted before I give you some time to work in groups again, take questions. So if you do have questions, challenges, things you want to build on this, um, we, we can take, it's a big group, but I think to have a few uh, responses, if you really feel, oh, Marvin's really got this wrong, there's, or he's really missed something, or he's miscommunicated, and something needs to be uh, articulated, we will have a little question and answer or problem time at the end. Um, so, the second cultural uh, development that has, um, in a sense, has contributed to the death of character education is the ethics of authenticity. Um, now, Charles Taylor has famously written about the ethics of authenticity um, and simply stated what the ethics of authenticity is, is that what really counts for a human being is to be yourself. Yeah, that, that is the real ethic, is that you are authentic, that you are really you. Um, th this is the new vision of human autonomy, moral subjectivism rules, um, and, and in a sense, we are all, at least as, as Europeans, we are all liberals. And hence, we can do and we can be anything, as long as we don't damage others. Our secular age, Taylor argues, is characterized by resistance to any sort of moralization by anyone. It is resistant to external standards that impose on my personal preference and choice. Um, educationally, very interesting, this has led in a shift away from language on virtue toward a language on values. Now we think values is a good thing, and values are a good thing, but the educational shift even in North America, for example, there's a study that's been done on this, the educational shift in North American secondary schools from what used to be very strong moral education in, in secondary schools has moved completely away from that to uh, courses in values clarification. And you can immediately see the difference when you move from virtues that are objective to values which are subjective. Um, values is the new way. So. In, in this choir, in this cultural choir in, in which we live, in our culture, which is singing to the tune of the ethics of authenticity, character education simply sings out of harmony. If we do it, we are very quickly accused of paternalism. And that is inappropriate. It seems culturally odd to shape students to be courageous, merciful, self-controlled. Um, it seems odd to have measures in place to even penalize students whose character is insufficient or whose growth in character is insufficient. Our culture screams at us and we perhaps whisper with our culture, who are we to say? Who are we to judge? It is between them and the Lord or their heart is in the right place. We are no longer the sages on the stage. We are the guides on the side. Who are we? But are we not educators? Are we not there to shape, to say, even to judge, to stand prophetically in the gap as those that the Lord is using to speak to our students and charge them and change them to become fit for service and for leadership? So again, ethics of authenticity, it is a counterweight, and it can contribute to the death of character education. My third cultural point is that, so I'd only say it once, <laughs> a society that has turned to therapy, how's that? Um, we live, and I want to be cautious here, uh, and let me say at the outset, 
I'm not against therapy. I'm not against counseling. I'm not against psychotherapy. Uh, so much good can come to human beings uh, through, these, through a genuine use of, uh, of these approaches. But here's my point. We live in a generation of wounded souls, of broken hearts, of traumatized children who have never been healed in their memories. Now, all generations, I think, across history and across cultures could say the same thing. I think our generation is the one who has shaped their identities around those narratives. And so our students come to us, and their identities often are shaped around being wounded, being traumatized. Um, and this can be a danger in a culture whose belly is too soft. While being loving, it can go too far. So this then leads us as theological educators or as pastors and churches of reframing sin and vice as expression of wound and trauma. Where selfishness and acedia become OCD and depression that need cure. Where fault always lies with someone else. Usually your parents. And vice always has a justification. Oh, if only you knew what I had been through as a child. And I'm not saying that's wrong. Don't hear me wrong. There's a lot of very good and very important things in that. But I hope you hear my counterpoint. So students come to us as victims, needy of love, wanting healing, wanting care, rather than as soldiers that are preparing for battle or clay wishing to be molded. They want to be self-fulfilled rather than freed from the bondage of sin. Grace is seen as a means to be loved and healed rather than as a means to be changed. Mm -hmm. As Plato would say, we as educators under this sort of pressure no longer serve the bitter herbs of education, but we only serve the dainties. All this, as you can imagine, makes character education and the cultivation of virtues in, that require toughness, determination, some rigorous self-assessment, even self-judgment to be able to change. All this makes that extremely problematic. Again, it's a counterweight. My fourth cultural point is, and maybe to not overwhelm you, I'll stop at point number four and take if there's one or two comments, yeah? So you'll get to have a change of voice and maybe we can change pace and then I'll, I'll come back to my list. Um, so my fourth point is a cultural, again, uh, development that um, obstacles character education is managerialism and measurability. Part of the perfect storm that wages against character education um, comes from the industrial and the scientific revolution. How so? Well, mostly with the concept of measurability. In, in a key book that talks about um, accreditation, actually, it's called Understanding Quality by Weston Burton, for whoever knows the book, it reminds us that the scientific revolution produced for the first time ever in history the possibility of accurate measurement which could be replicated leading to mass production of quality. Imagine Ford. Yeah? All of a sudden, you've got Ford. You can measure how many cars you can produce in a set amount of time and the quality of those cars, and you can measure it, you can monitor it, and therefore you can manage that process to have better and better outcomes. Now, this as a cultural development, it, it spilled over into education. The concepts of managerialism and measurability came into education um, through the tinted lens of scientific discipline that needed to be measured and managed. So what became a key thing in education was quality. And to determine quality, we need to do what? Measure. We measure. And so therefore, in higher education, we measure. 
How do we measure? Well, we measure in credits. And we measure in ECTS. And we measure in grades. And we measure in degree classification. And we measure in learning outcomes. And we measure in length of study cycles. And we measure in word counts in our essays, dissertations, and PhDs. And we measure in the adherence to prescriptive benchmarks and where we stand in those benchmarks. And then the government comes in and it measures our research output. And then they measure the ranking of our universities to determine on how many publications can be counted in which peer-reviewed journals, and blah, 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 and blah, blah. You see, it's measurement to determine quality. So how do you measure character? How do you attribute achievement in numerical fashion that can get into a spreadsheet and used to calculate a grade average or degree classification? Quite simply, you don't. <laughs> Virtue, if it's defined simply as doing the right thing for the right reason, escapes the ethics and the causal measurement of measurement. It just doesn't do it. Most educational tools in higher education in our culture are like a telescope that is trying to measure your body temperature. It is simply the wrong tool. It does other things very well. But since it does nothing for character education, it is not fit for purpose. Character education slips off the radar screen as a proper outcome of higher education. Because you have to measure it. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So we've got four points. Um, rationalism and research, ethics of authenticity, therapy and society, managerialism and measurability. Any comments or questions on that? Let's take three or four minutes to respond to some of that. I think the challenge is to be able to be clear, intentional, and central without falling into the trap of measurability, finding other ways to be clear and intentional. And probably we need to do further work on unpacking what we mean by measurability. If it has to do with numbers and spreadsheets alone, or if there are other ways of measuring. And I think to do even theological work on that would be very interesting. You know, as, as biblical scholars, for example, you know, to go in and think, you know, what is measurability you know, in Jesus' ministry to his disciples? Uh, you know, or in church work, or in, you know, how did God measure uh, the people of Israel and therefore send them into captivity? What, what were the, you know, there's obviously assessment going on of some sort. Um, so, um, I don't have an answer, but that's a really good question, I think a challenge for us. And, and let me say, I, I, most answers I don't have, I have plenty of questions. <laughs> yes, very good question. Okay, so the question is whether reason can have no play at all in character education. The answer is reason is fundamental in character education, at least in two ways, and I'll unpack this a little more tomorrow in the seminar of speaking of the neo-Aristotelian framework. He, for example, Aristotle would say that the reason needs to be engaged at two levels. One is in terms of virtue knowledge. There needs to be knowledge and understanding of virtue. And the second is virtue reasoning. So to be able to reason around virtue and how that applies to you and your world. And then there's other levels as well. But certainly there's, <clears throat> there is a beginning level of cognitive engagement character education and virtue, which is absolutely essential. So again, I, I think even what I said before supper and now, we, we really need to be careful about setting up false dichotomies, which we don't want to do. You know, we don't want to say, ah, there's reason and then there's character education, or you know, there's academics and then there's spiritual formation. We're using these categories to try to, um, it's, it's like over supper we were talking about, it's like a glass of wine. You know, it, the, the wine is an irreducibly complex composition. Uh, but you can say there is water in it, there's sugar in it, and there's something else in it. And if you want to make the wine better, you, you can say, oh, it's got too much sugar, or not enough, or too much water. So, but the wine itself is irreducibly complex. And so we are holistic beings. To try to rip apart, as we are doing, to try to analyze where we are, is a very dangerous operation. You could kill the patient in the, in the, in the doing of it. So yes, thank you. That's a, that's a really good point. Okay, let's take one more or two, two more, and then we'll go on with my fire hydrant. I, I think that is the challenge for us to take um, as you know the, the spoils of Egypt in Athens that take we take with us we, from from the Egyptians and they, they accompany us in our in our travel toward toward knowledge of God. So I think to see Athens as in a sense the spoils of Egypt that can, can come with us, but they are clearly not the revelation of God. 
um, they are something good. And again, it depends on where we stand on issues like common grace, and you know, we get into long theological debates on that. But I think that is a key question for us as theological educators to see the input that's coming at us from a model like Athens and Paideia and work theologically on that. And I think I think Peter and Parush in the devotions, um, in deal, they're going to both. On, well, I'll anticipate their text. They're both going to be working on on Second Peter one that we read this morning. They were both going to vote, and I think some of the things they're going to tell us from that text are going to perhaps answer some of your questions. There are some very different things from idea in Christian. Very good. Very good. <laughs> and again, I think that's part of the project of virtue understanding. Understanding what exactly we mean by virtue is it a monolithic golden brick that simply is never changes, or are there contextual factors you know that that feed into it? So yes, thank you. That's that's really important. As you can see, we're scratching the tips of many icebergs. Yeah, Horst had one final question. Yeah. yeah. Yes, because by excellence of results in your example of medicine, what is meant is grades. Yeah. How did he do on his exams, his papers, his research, whatever? That that is the definition of excellence of results. And then if he has no empathy, you know. Okay, um, let's, let's go on to the, the next set of points are more educational. Um, so, uh, Babylonian captivity of accreditation. Now, clearly, <laughs> EAA is an accreditation agency, so I need to be careful we don't shoot ourselves in the foot. Um, but the, the whole issue of quality management in point four, you can see how that very easily and seamlessly moves into accreditation. Um, and actually, accreditation has not been with us forever. It is also a cultural development, um, in, in, in a great measure linked to the total quality management paradigms in education and in other sectors. So accreditation, simply put, um, the point is to give credit to those who are giving credit. Um, it is about separating out the diploma mills from those who are doing proper higher education. Now, of course, how we define proper. Um, accreditation is there to protect students. It's there to enhance trust between universities and with employers. Accreditation is there to help define quality, fitness for purpose, and then make sure that schools are achieving benchmarks. Now, there's a lot of good to that, but like Daniel and Babylon, we need to be discerning. There are things that we can accept yeah, Daniel did accept to change his name. It was called Belshazzar. So he actually accepted the nomenclature, if <laughs> you wish. Um, he, he embraced the training of the king. He worked toward the competences of the kingdom he was living in. But there were aspects that he had to filter out. There were dainties, and he had to eat lentils. And there were aspects that were missing in the king's curricula. There were no dreams and visions. And actually, dreams and visions turned out to be the bit that actually saved the kingdom. So there are aspects of this captivity that we need to stand back and be able to see where we are. Um, now, this morning we, well, sorry, this morning, before lunch, it seemed like this morning, um, we, we started thinking theologically about whether character education is actually part of the process. And I think even just on a very shallow bit of work we did around the tables, I think we probably started nodding in the direction of saying, yeah, we do, we actually can see as theologians that character education is part of God's plan for us. But character education is not part of the plans of secular accreditation for us. That's my point. A school who does nothing in the area of character education will not be labeled by a secular accreditation uh, agency as a diploma mill. They will not come to you and say, well, no, you can't. You can offer a degree here, you're not a proper university because you don't do character education. Secular accreditation does not see character education as a key feature in any higher education institution, including theological ones. Secular accreditation does not include character education in its definition of quality, nor does it consider that it has its, that its business is to help students become fit for the purpose of generating virtue and good character. That's not part of it. Um, character education asks, and here I've got a little image, hopefully it doesn't go too much out of focus, but well, it does. Um, these are the Dublin descriptors, um, and they're sort of at the core of the Bologna process, which a lot of us have been 
sort of struggling through and seeing a lot of good in, so don't get me wrong. But if you read the five areas of the Dublin descriptors, which are the, in a sense, they're the song sheet that all of the accrediting agencies are singing off of. So all of the national accrediting agencies, so from the QAA in England to uh, whatever it is in, in the countries you live in, it's the Dublin descriptors and the European um, uh, standards that are informing their accreditation. Here, there's five things that are being asked for. Demonstration of knowledge and understanding, application of knowledge and understanding to work with vocation, ability to gather and interpret data and form judgments, ability to communicate information, ability to develop learning skills to continue to study. Those are the five. Which one does character education fit into? None. There's simply no box to put the product in. So there's no room, that is my point. Um, now, in my mind, that is a very good, solid reason to justify the existence of accrediting agencies like the EEAA, or like the ISAT, the global body of accrediting bodies that are evangelical. We met, and I'll report on this a little more tomorrow during the business session, <coughs> we met in Rome, in September, all of the 11 uh, ISAT accrediting agencies and the result has been the Rome Declaration um, in which the ISAT agencies have now <coughs> covenanted together to draft common accreditation standards uh, for undergraduate theological education in the evangelical world across the world. So the process will take a couple of years. By the end of that, any accreditation that we do in Europe will be on the same standards in any part of the world, which is something we have to be <coughs> very significant. One of the points in the Rome Declaration, there's five or six points, and I can, I can give you the document, it's fresh off the press. One of the points was this. The ISAT agencies, representing over 1,200 theological schools in the world that are accredited by these 11 agencies, committed to integrating principles, quality measures, and assessment of character education into our global indicators within our vision of holistic theological education. That, to me, is a good justification of why we exist as an agency, coming alongside what is happening in secular accreditation with something that is actually different and makes us all accountable. Number six, <clears throat> which is, again, educational, is the loss of university. This is a little <clears throat> simpler. Um, very simply to say here that <clears throat> while medieval and classical learning were permeated by a vision of unity that was rooted in Greek thinking and Christian theology. Um, this unity also applied to virtue and character. Um, and so this vision of irreducible complexity was actually there, where if you took one stone of virtue out of the cathedral, the entire edifice would crumble. So there was much more a vision of unity in education. What modernity did is it shook the vision. And post-modernity has replaced the vision of unity with a vision of fragmentation and diversity where not only can the virtues be dealt with in isolation from any other learning outcomes, but the virtues themselves are rootless, isolated, and fragmented. <clears throat> G.K. Chesterton has written uh, very interestingly on the virtues gone wild. I encourage you to Google Chesterton, virtues gone wild, and read what he said. Um, virtues gone wild, Chesterton means that they can be taken one by one. And if they don't have each other to balance each other within a holistic vision, they can create disaster. He says virtues in isolation often are worse than vices. <clears throat> Number seven, so we go from Babylon to Rome, the Roman occupation of standard curricula. Now, <clears throat> one of the features of the Roman troops <clears throat> marching into um, um, you in Northern Europe um, is that the Roman troops would march in in squares. <clears throat> Yeah. So the Romans would do battle with square shields, square formation, go out to the field and, you know, and sometimes encountering um, people had different ways of doing battle. It was a little different, uh, difficult. You know, what do you mean you're just going to run at us from all directions in the forest? You know, can't we have a proper square and just do a proper battle? So th this approach to, to battle it, it leads me to the Roman occupation of standard curricula. Um, just like the Roman troops that neatly set themselves out in ordered formations and so conquered the world, so most yeah. evangelical European schools have basically adopted standard curricula. Oh, like, some historically, this has come from North America in some cases. Um, accrediting agencies have actually had their part in perpetuating it. But further back, 
this sort of standard curricula comes from Schleiermacher. And when he, his categories of systematics, biblical studies, dogmatics, history, practical theology. And you've probably heard this bit before, the four so-called four Silas's of theological education. Um, and so education happens in this formation of four Silas's. And professors are trained to be an expert in one of these four Silas's. So when I asked before the discussion before, okay, biblical scholars, systematicians, you immediately, oh, you know which box to it. Um, so you're trained to be an expert to get a job to perpetuate your discipline or your subdiscipline. Now, many have written on the problems of this fragmentation, so I won't rehearse the arguments. But my question here is, where is the place of character education in the four silences of our curriculum? Does it fit into biblical studies? Does it fit into systematics? Does it fit into dogmatics and historical studies? Does it fit into practical theology? Now, I see Lydia nodding, and I think I will try to argue that it fits in all four. But, but that's very idealistic. Realistically, it fits in none. Um, think of the curricular map of your degrees. My thesis is that generally character education, A, does not pervade the curricula, B, does not even appear as a distinct field. So it not only does not, as, as I think a good thing would be, to be sprinkled throughout, to be integrated, that, that rarely happens. So not only does that not happen, it doesn't even appear distinctly on its own, which would be a lesser, a lesser good but at least something. Now, <clears throat> some may argue, aha, wait, no, okay. Character education actually fits into practical theology. And in particular, character education fits into ethics. I don't think so. I think it might. I think in reality it doesn't. Most of our ethics courses, if we're honest, are about thinking about the good, not about being good. We, our ethics courses have to do with ethical dilemmas, with how to face these issues and all very good things, but the study of ethics has replaced the practice of virtue. Kierkegaard reminds us of the dangers of this. We can fool ourselves to be ethical people because we have knowledge about ethics. That's a starting point. It is not character education. So, hence the Roman occupation of these four Silas is simply no box in which to place character education, and it is an orphan. Eight. <clears throat> and <clears throat> now we're moving into more the contextual factors of our own evangelical sort of uh, theological education. Um, and I've got three final points. Um, briefly. One, <clears throat> discipline replaces character education. I believe all of our schools have disciplinary codes. Yeah? There are some things that if your students do, there are consequences. <laughs> um, usually, well, it depends on your tradition. You know, it, can be as, it can be as light as smoking. You know, well, if you smoke in the dorms, then consequences. Two, usually all of our schools would certainly have some sort of a sexual behavior, code of conduct, if certain things happen in our campus, we consider that serious, uh, and there are consequences. Then, of course, it gets worse uh, if you know, students are engaging with pornography or with drug consumption, or, you know, and, and the list goes on. So we, so we have some things that are, we consider very serious, and therefore there are disciplinary codes and procedures. I'm arguing that this could fool us that we're doing character education, we're not. Uh, discipline is a good thing, it's not character education. The practice of discipline can fool us that we are engaged in character education. And while this is a start and may have some sort of a deterrent educational value, it's insufficient to be called in any way character education. And I, I, put, I, I put the image here of a, of a referee. Um, we, we wait till someone commits a really bad foul and then we book them. But maybe we don't have the structures in place to actually teach them how to play clean soccer. Um, so the booking is not education. Um, this often can happen in local churches as well. 
Uh, discipline is not discipleship. It's a part of it, but it's not the whole thing. Number nine and ten, and here I'm coming to your point um, that you anticipated. Um, number nine, the safety of academics. Of the four horses of theological education, academics is obviously the safest one. It is the least invasive into your actual life. Because you can be a great critical thinker and don't need to change anything about yourself. Actually, to teach critical thinking can be particularly enticing. Um, there's a status about teaching your school students how to think critically and maybe even edging into the vice. For you're not telling your students what to think. You're not telling them what to be. You're teaching them how to decide for themselves, assuming that if you give them the right rational tools and freedom, then they will sort it out. And often they don't. But it is very safe. Um, safe as it is, I would find great difficulty in justifying this scripturally or theologically, that this is the safe place we need to inhabit. The sterilized environment of academics can kill the beneficial bacteria And finally, <clears throat> professional, professor, all for professionalism. But <clears throat> if we think of the profession of the lecturer, the word itself, lecturer, lexio, comes from the Latin lexio and the disputatio were the two key tools of medieval universities in Europe for 500 years. The lexio was about reading the text and the disputatio was about critical thinking around it. Um, and today, in the job descriptions and in the hiring criteria for most of our faculty member, what are we looking for? What do they actually do when they come to us? There are usually three rocks in the jar. Teaching, research, and supervision. And we hire them on the basis of their teaching qualifications, of their research career, and their ability to supervise. Although we do nod in the direction of references, we hire mainly on the basis of academic credentials, publications, and teaching experience. When we read the CV, when we read, when we have an interview with a new faculty potential member, character is often not there and it is easily hidden. But how many of us have then been surprised to discover a colleague on our team who is undisciplined? arrogant, unwilling to listen, ungenerous, not meek, boastful, and so forth. Character can easily slip to the side and both the caught and the top dimension of character education loses the important agents of the faculty members because of the profession of the professional. So these are 10 reasons that have come to me. There's probably more, some of them may not be as robust as I think they are, and other reasons can be imagined, but in a sense, there is a perfect storm that is sinking the ship of character education. And so tonight on this rather somber note, we uh, <coughs> our reflection on this. Okay, I'm done, what I have to say. Um, let's do take another <clears throat> maybe few minutes for questions or comments on any of these. <clears throat> and then I have an exercise for you to talk to each other again, and then we'll be off to bed. Um, okay, any questions or, or comments on these last um, six points. Yeah, we're using words that are very rich. So, you know, the word discipline <clears throat> is such a rich word. And here I've used it in a very <clears throat> narrow sense of discipline in the sense of, oh, you've done this, therefore there's consequences and that not. But obviously, <clears throat> discipline is an integral part of virtue. Uh, if virtue has to do with creating habits, habits are often created through discipline. Um, and, and so discipline needs to be there added in the shaping of virtues. Um, so. F, yes, point taken, thanks. Million dollar question. <clears throat> we don't know yet. Um, as I said, agencies, our commitment in the next years <clears throat> is to investigate exactly that and to discuss it with you. <clears throat> so when this is built into our standards, when we come to an accreditation visit to you, that is going to be our conversation. Okay, we, we agree on the target. How are we going to hit this? Um, so, yes. And I think there are some models of good practice, and hopefully in this conference as well, as we discussed, that was also one of the reasons for having around the tables. There may be things that you do in your school that are actually very, very good um, and can help others to answer exactly that question. 
I mean, one example also is that some schools together with uh, a degree <coughs> issue um, a letter or some sort of a formal sort of thing that has to do with the character, the piety of, of that particular student. And <coughs> I think if you create a culture, even in the churches and the stakeholders where our graduates are going, that that is part of what goes with, you know, it's a sort of a, an additional diploma supplement that deals with these issues, which isn't graded, but it's obviously assessed in a different way. Um, if you and I were church leaders looking to hire a youth pastor, we probably wouldn't look at the grades. <laughs> when the student graduated the top grade, we want to look at the letter to see, okay, how, what is the character? How is this student even grown? And one thing that struck me about what you do in, in Beirut was um, even the assessment of character is not, it's not the same size fits all. They, they try to assess growth in characters. So obviously, students are going to come to us, some are going to be more disadvantaged because they're coming from a background where there's major issues of character. Others are coming maybe from very solid Christian families where character education has been part of their upbringing through their, their parents, and so they're much, in a sense, further along the road. So what they try to assess is not the same measure for everyone, but it's growth during the time that they're spending with them, and that's part of their assessment. So I think there's, there are, you know, and you're very creative people, I think once you see the problem, um, it would be great to see in years how we actually develop this. And I think as EAA, we look forward to actually having this conversation with you in our accreditation visits and, and, this, uh, and then sharing good practice. And in a sense, what we do as accreditors as well, when we come to your college, we're kind of like the bees. We fly around with pollen on our wings. You know, <laughs> and we come into your college and we can bring some pollen from somewhere else. And, oh, you know what they're doing over there? It's a really good idea. And so, but again, it needs to be seen, I think, by us as an important contribution to society. It took Bill in writing about democracy in North America, he wrote that democracy only works with a virtuous citizenry. If the citizens are good, democracy works. Tocqueville wrote the minute that character falls through the cracks, that virtue is no longer there, democracy is a horrendous arrangement. Well, that's maybe a little strong. He may not have said it exactly that way, but that's the way I'd like to say it. Um, and I think some of the crises of our democracies, we have some of the votes that we've seen, um, if democracy is not maintained by a virtuous group of, of voters, and there's many votes, uh, virtues that can go into that, but the consequences are not always good. Okay, I think I'm gonna close it down because we're, we're, we've run out of things to say, uh, or questions to ask each other. Um, I was simply going to ask you about um, the risks. This is the, the discussion question that I <clears throat> prepared for you. So if character education in theological education is dead, what do we risk losing? Um, when we sort of uh, <clears throat> think about that, uh, that question. Just, just one final uh, <clears throat> comment. Um, so this is my last plenary. Tomorrow in, the, in my seminar, I'll actually be doing a little more uh, examples of possible ways to do this. Uh, so it could apply to online uh, character education, but a lot of it is theological education. So um, this is not to say you need to come to my seminar, but it is to say that if you go on, on the blog, everything that I've said today is in there in video form, and everything that I will say in my seminar tomorrow, so for example, the theoretical framework of near Aristotelian uh, <coughs> approaches, there's a video on that, there's a video actually giving ideas on how to create a structure uh, for character education in a program. So it, it's all there in the videos. So if you're not in my, not, not, hopefully somebody still will come to my seminar tomorrow, uh, or else I'll go to the sauna. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and engagement.